Then, as we said, he directs his son to that which is most important. He says, do not, la tushrik billah, don't commit shirk with Allah. Meaning, never associate anything or anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his, in his that, in his essence, in his attributes, his sifat, in his actions. Allah is alone. So he is, the first lesson is the lesson of tawheed, of who is Allah and who is to be worshipped alone. Tawheed, first and foremost, and that's a lesson for us. That's the most important thing that we teach, the most foundational belief. Because without this bedrock, there is no deen, there is no akhlaq, there is nothing. There is no success. So the first thing that Luqman wants his son to know is to know Allah above everything else. And shirk for our youngsters and for reminding ourselves is it includes the belief that there are other beings that have part in divinity like some other faiths believe, or there are partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And shirk is the ultimate peak of injustice, of dhulm, because it, by shirk, it negates the faith, iman of Islam, of, of Islam, of Muslim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it shirk, la dhulmun azim. Indeed, it's the ultimate of dhulm. Dhulm means injustice, azim. The worst of all acts of oppression, the greatest injustice that Allah, the one who created you, who sustains the entire universe and everything within it, this person does wrong by denying or putting partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only that, he exposes himself or herself to the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his anger. And if you look, shukr gratitude and shirk have the same three alphabets just the order changes if you change the order from shukr you can go into shirk so they are actually opposite of each other okay this is the beauty of this language so these days we have to be careful we consider shirk as oh i don't worship idols i don't do this i don't have a uh, gold, golden calf that I'm worshipping, but there are other forms of shirk, which is called the hidden shirk, the shirk khafi, or sagheer. Nothing is sagheer about it, but it's hidden. What does shirk, what is that? And this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, he said, I'm not concerned for my ummah that they will be worshipping idols, they'll be doing major shirk. I'm concerned about the khafi shirk. What is this? So they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, what is this? He said, he gave an example. He said, a person who is doing a salah, is worshipping Allah. Then he becomes aware that there is someone else who comes in there and the quality of his salah improves. He starts reciting beautifully, better khushu, and his sujood improves, his ruku improves, and it looks like, whoa, what a pious person. And the salah quality changed by the presence. He said this khafi shirk. Because in the act of ibadah, it changed because of the presence of someone other than Allah. Because Allah was always in front of him. So he gave us this, <coughs> this example. So we have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is tayyib. He is pure and he accepts only that which is pure. Any little shirk in it, it becomes a sin instead of a good deed. So when this command comes, la tushrik billah, don't commit shirk, it includes all forms of hidden shirk. The failure even to acknowledge in our hearts or by our words that everything, the doer, the enabler is of everything is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we start appreciating ourselves, our achievement. Look at the three-pointer I threw from half court, right? Simple thing. I, what is the statistical probability of it going in if it went in? Okay, I landed this job, I got this, and I was, you know, summa cum, cum laude in my class, and whatever it is. Similarly, having concerns about provision, 
I lost my job. Where am I going to eat from? That's a form of hidden shirk. Because you have just denied that razak is Allah. You thought your job. Well, my husband lost his job. Now what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen. Risk would come from some other means. Maybe he'll get another job. Maybe he will not get a job. You will still eat. So we have to know that there are other forms of shirk. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls this la dhulmun adim. Dhulm means injustice. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Dhulm in this dunya will lead to dhulumat, which means dark, multiple darknesses in the hereafter. <clears throat> Next two ayats, ayats 14 and 15, we will take together. وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمَّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَىٰ وَهْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنٍ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ First. The fifteenth ayah: وَإِنْ جَاهَدَكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَةً وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, and we have commanded people to honor their parents. Listen carefully. Don't fall asleep on me now, children. We have commanded people to honor their parents. Then he says, their mothers bore them through weakness and hardship upon <coughs> hardship. And their weaning takes two years. So be grateful to me, Allah and your parents. Allah has joined the parents with him. And then he says, to me is your final return. That's like a warning. That means you will be asked about how you treated your parents. And the second ayah, and we'll break it down a little bit. But if they strive, your, your parents, and pressure you to associate with me, in other words, to commit shirk, what you have no knowledge of, then do not obey them. But still, listen to this, still keep their company in this world with courtesy and honor. And, but follow the way of those who turn to me in devotion. Then to me you will all return and then I will inform you of what you used to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself here, he supplements the advice of Luqman alayhi salam by highlighting the status of the parents. The father is giving this advice. What is a father in general terms? Okay. So. Because somebody might say, well, this is all the advice to the child. This is a child's rights. What about parental rights? What are our rights? Allah SWT himself puts the parental rights here by mentioning in the same ayah the parental rights of honoring them, respecting them, and being grateful to your parents, as Allah SWT says. And by joining them makes it the most important aspect of Islam, which is worshipping Allah alone. Then he highlights the extreme importance in Islam of kindness, honor, respect, and gratitude to the parents. In the same verse, <coughs> and last time we mentioned this briefly, one of our great commentators, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, from whom all the Hanafi madhab comes, said that Allah has paired certain things in the Quran, as we said last time, salah and zakat, are paired, they come together. Atiullah, Atiur Rasul, obey Allah, obey the Messenger. And he said, worshipping Allah and being good to your parents have been paired because it comes in more than one place. And we can add, Allah SWT has paired Iman with Amal Salih also. <coughs> now, there are fathers here who might say, I'm a parent. Why is it that Allah SWT only mentions the mothers? He doesn't mention the father here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the sacrifices and difficulties of the mother only because they go through difficulties and suffering in carrying the child, delivering the child, and nursing the child during the most vulnerable state of helplessness for two more years. So, And this greater contribution, the mother is doing much more. 
Okay, the father has nothing to do with first nine months, nothing to do with it. After that, you might even help a little bit in changing diapers, but that's it. Okay, so this greater contribution of the mother occurs at a time and a stage where our cognition and our memory have not fully developed. So we don't remember all of the sacrifices that the mother did. And therefore, many of us don't recognize and acknowledge these favors. However, the father's favors and contributions are easier to recognize and remember because they come when we have developed some memory and some recognition. Oh, my father gave me this. My father bought me a bicycle. My father took me fishing, you know, so on and so forth and whatever it is. Therefore, it is easier to remember those. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this powerful way reminds us all of the mother's favors. Lest we forget. And that's why, if you remember, in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu when somebody asked him, who has the greatest right on you? He says, Ummuk, Ummuk, third, three times, Ummuk, 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 Abi. Three times the mother. Okay. So, as they say in today's lingo, mothers get top billing. Okay. For good reason. Right. <coughs> and of course, there are <coughs> a hadith to the effect that Paradise lies below, you know, under the feet of your mothers. In other words, if you, the way you serve them, you can achieve paradise through them. Just remember, especially in the moments when you're upset with your parents, they're not letting me do what I want, they won't get me what I want, and so on and so forth, that if it was not for our parents, their sacrifices, their forbearance, we would not have been born in this world. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them to be the means of our coming into this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose our parents for us. It is through our parents that we are fed, that we are protected, that we are loved, that we are nurtured, that we are educated, that we are clothed, and most importantly, connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the time of infancy till we become mature. And therefore, Allah demands, He commands, gratitude and respect for the parents from the children. Of course, we all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, the sole original reason for our existence. So our first allegiance is to him alone. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Mashkur li, thank me, wali walidayk, and your parents, your two parents in the same ayah. Thank me and thank your parents. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned and defended parental rights by himself. And then he reminds us that we will return to him and Allah will ask us about our treatment of our parents. And how does the honoring of the parents start? Just at a basic level is how we address, how we respond to our parents. And that includes body language. The parent says something, that's what I say. What are you doing? So I didn't say anything. Yes, you, you said a lot. You said a lot by your expression. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says elsewhere in the, in the Quran that even if your parents become unreasonable reasonable, in their old age, dementia, don't even <coughs> say what? Oof. If you can't say that, mm. oof means just impatience. And everything beyond that is also forbidden. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we have to be careful with our tongues, our body language, especially in a moment when we are upset. Rasulullah sallallahu said, Rida rabbi fi rida walid wa sakhatu rabbi fi sakhatil walid, which means the pleasure of the Lord is in the pleasure of the parents, and the displeasure of the Lord is in the displeasure of the parents. So every time you displease your parents, you displease Allah. Every time you please your parents, you please Allah. How easy is that? Please your parents, you please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, just doing what comes naturally, being good to your parents, will increase Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure and blessing upon you. And 
the best way to show gratitude for your parents have, is to walk the path of Islam. But my parents gave me, left me with this. Because most of us here, all of us here, are born into Islam. It's not like we were born elsewhere and Allah guided us. Now, there are some fiqhi rulings that are derived from this ayah, very interesting. Uh, I'm going to skip them right now. If we have time in the end, uh, you remind me and we'll go over it. The next ayah, some parents, some children might say, what, and this is very real today, what if my parents are not good? They're evil. They're into drugs. They're, they're abusive. They drink. All of that. Why should they be honored? So that's what Allah has mentioned in that second ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even if they go to the extent of taking you out of the out of the, my worship into shirk, say, don't do that. But what should you do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not accept what is wrong from them in matters. Uh, that lead to disobedience from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us, he says, لا تعت المخلوق في معصية الخالق that there is no obedience to the creation that involves disobedience of the khaliq, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is no such thing. But beyond that, وَصَحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا In this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, sahib, be, give them companionship of goodness. Be there for them. Treat them. Even if they're like that. Even if they're abusive. Be kind to them. Sahibu. Sahba means not calling once a year Mother's Day or Father's Day. Sahba means frequently visiting them, being with them. Sahibu huma. Both of them. Fit dunya. As long as they're alive. Because in the akhirah, if they're like that, you will be separated. Okay. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in this dunya, you be good to them. Now, if we remember in the early stages, this is a Makkan Surah, as we said, that some of the companions of Rasulullah faced strong oppositions from their parents. They were tired, they were imprisoned, they were beaten, they were tortured. Leave Islam. At that stage, Allah SWT told them, be good to your parents, even with that. And this is also illustrated in the kindness and virtue and, and uh, respect in the story of Ibrahim salam and his father Azar. Ibrahim salam is inviting him to the, to the right thing and Azar is saying that get out of here, I'm going to stone you. And then he says salam to him and leaves because he is being expelled. So even in that, we show them respect but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاتَّبَعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَلِي But in terms of following, don't follow that wrong way they're taking you. Obey those who walk sabila of Allah, the path of Allah. So walk the path of those who have chosen to obey Allah. And what does this teach us? The importance of good companionship. Good friends we choose. We should choose those who are walking the path through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, we will easily be led astray. Ayah number 16. Then he says, Ya bunayya innaha intakum ithqal habbatin min khardalin fatakum fi sakhratin aw fi samawati aw fi al-ard yati biha Allah inna Allah latifun khabir. Oh my dear son, even if there is a deed which is the weight, weight of a mustard seed, rai kadana, you know that little thing. That is in a bowl, in a rock, in a boulder, sakhra, large rock in a boulder, anywhere in the universe or on the earth. Yet Allah will bring it out. Bring it out means in the dunya, he may choose to expose it, what you did or what you said. But certainly in the Akhra it will be brought out for questioning and hisab. What is it saying? It is saying that nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if it is that small, this is the example that's given. So Luqman alayhi salam is building on that tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by teaching the attributes 
the sifat of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him understand that there is the concept of accountability. You are accountable for what you say and you do. And that every action and word has consequences. Something is, there is a result to that. Good, and especially if the action is not good. So, he's saying that even if it's a matter that seems insignificant to you, it's small. Now think about it. If there is a tiny little speck and it's in a rock, how can you and I bring it out of there and find it? Reflect on this example. Suppose there's a huge rock the size of just this room and there is this grain, something as small as that. How can you bring it out? You split it in two. It may not be seen. Split it. You have to pulverize and make it into a powder that is smaller than that grain. Then only it will. So how difficult it is for us. Yet for Allah, it is all known. Because Allah knows whether we accept it or not. Every action, every word, every relationship, every thought. The past, what was. The present, what is. The future, what will be. And the future that could have been but will never be. All of that is known to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is hidden. This is what you and I have to. Nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to reflect on this. And he says, anywhere in the universe, if it was, Allah knows it. Telling his son and telling us what is the power and precision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he will make it known in this dunya and in the akhirah it will come out. So what should we do? What do we learn from this? That we should be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. What is called the state of ihsan, which means that you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of you. And since you can't see him, he sees you. It's in the terms of, of the sawwuf of, of uh, tazkiyah, it is called muraqaba. Because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-raqib. One of his name is ar-raqib means ever watchful. So muraqaba is in the process of tazkiyah of nafs is that it's critical that we always remain in an inner state of awareness of ourselves, not just of our actions. What am I doing? What I'm saying? But what kind of thoughts are in my heart? Monitoring my heart. What thoughts enter? What is entertained? What is rejected? And then what emanates of actions and words as a result of what is going on, the conversations inside my heart. Allah is watching, I need to be watchful. 